Hello, welcome to this session titled Processes and Infrastructures in Creative and Artistic Products, linked to the track Futures and Heritage. This session includes three papers. The first paper, titled Complex Acquisitions, Understanding the Infrastructural Properties of Born Digital Objects in Museum Collections, will be presented by Gabriela Arrigoni and Natalie Kane. The paper contributes to debates about the conceptualization of born digital objects. Then we have Paula Fernandez Valdez and Regina Rivas Tornes presenting the paper Setting Limits in Preservation Strategies for the Stage of Acquisitions a feasibility approach for media art. This paper approached the field of art preservation in the digital era. And finally, Ricardo del Farra uh, will share his paper Memories, Death or the Desire of Immortality that focuses on the Latin American electronic acoustic music collection. Thank you for all the authors for sharing such interesting work and thank you everyone for coming. So let's enjoy the, the presentations. Hi everyone, thanks for having me today, uh, albeit uh, remotely not live. I'm going to present my paper on complex acquisitions, understanding the infrastructural properties of potential objects in museum collections. Uh, this uh, uh, paper has emerged from research conducted uh, within a scoping project led by the Victoria and Albert Museum in collaboration with uh, the British Film Institute and Birkbeck University in London. Uh, which uh, was looking at the challenges faced by museums and archives in collecting and preserving more digital objects. Uh, in the project, uh, we considered uh, a broad range of object types, including uh, digital product design, uh, interface and platform design, immersive technologies, uh, mobile apps, video games, uh, artistic, uh, as well as commercial, commercial objects. And our aim was uh, to lay the foundation for future more focused research uh, and to build capacity and confidence across the heritage sector, ultimately making sure that more of the heritage of our contemporary digital culture is uh, safeguarded. Some of the challenges of uh, preserving digital culture, in fact, are associated with the way uh, some board digital objects uh, elude the traditional self-contained object hood typical of museum objects. In particular, one of the problems uh, concerns uh, the identification of uh, clear boundaries uh, uh, for artifacts that come to life uh, in online environments, uh, incorporating uh, user-generated content and uh, encompassing a range of components uh, from source code, uh, hardware and controllers, uh, from patches, software, packaging, marketing materials, not to mention contextual materials uh, and documentation of uh, interaction. So the paper explores three case studies to emphasize how complex board digital objects rely on multiple infrastructures and present infrastructural properties which have an impact on the way they are acquired and accommodated within the collection. And the concept of infrastructurality then here is proposed within the specific context of the museum collection. Uh, to support curators and conservators uh, in addressing the process of uh, decontextualization and recontextualization of the object uh, from its original online and networked environment uh, um, to the museum's own uh, infrastructure. The case studies are uh, three ongoing or very recent acquisitions by the VNA uh, or and the BFI but help to identify three particular ways in which complex but digital acquisitions reveal infrastructural properties. One is about hybridity that we have when the object presents both uh, digital and physical parts. 
The second one is about collecting elements of the making process, and the third one is about the perceived lack of boundaries of the object, when it becomes especially difficult to identify what should be part of the acquisition and where to draw a line, basically. So I'm going to spend a few words on uh, each of these examples. Um, in the Eyes of the Animal is a virtual reality piece that enables users to experience a forest from the perspective of three animals. It's been presented in many different contexts and versions, uh, some of which were accompanied by the use of bespoke uh, sculptural mossy headsets and vibrating backpacks synchronized with the sound to deliver an especially immersive and haptic experience, uh, as you can see in this picture. And these hardware bits uh, were uh, quite integral to the piece, but the collecting institution, the BFI, has a collection policy which only covers the collection of film and moving image materials um, and not of physical objects. And as a consequence, the BFI doesn't have the infrastructure, the resources and expertise to care for physical objects such as the hardware. Uh, therefore, this example gave us the chance to explore issues of policy fit and to discuss the value of uh, experimenting with collecting uh, objects that challenge the institutional readiness to accommodate them. Uh, Geist is our second example. Uh, it is a procedurally generated digital film acquired together with a set of materials that capture the making process, and this was um, acquired by the VNA. Uh, these materials include uh, the microsite, which has been archived using a tool called Conifer, developed by Rhizome, uh, animated patterns, uh, work in progress, 3D objects, uh, uh, a big number of uh, research and development clips, and so on. And we used this case study to discuss the link uh, across production and presentation technologies, and more importantly for, for this paper, to analyze the significant change of practice within the VNA as uh, uh, core object and the designs uh, making um, documentation of the making process are usually kept separate in the institution, while in this case, this traditional hierarchical separation between the main object, which in this case is the video, and the, the documentation, which uh, usually falls under the definition of auxiliary items. Uh, in this case, it, it's challenging, it's disrupted, uh, as the process elements are valued just as much as the final product uh, and treated in the same way from uh, a curatorial, but also a collection management uh, system perspective. The third case is Instagram, which was a speculative example, uh, not actually acquired by an institution, but we wanted to explore uh, the particular challenges of collecting such a difficult object. And in fact, it is here where the infrastructural character of the poor digital is more evident. Digital platforms are shared, are manifested through performances that uh, are unique to each user. They are programmable with multiple features uh, and evolving from one version to the other. And also they are embedded into an extensive infrastructure of digital and physical systems. So to develop this case study, we speculated together with a number of museum professionals on how to capture a meaningful snapshot of Instagram, considering but the acquisition could, could incorporate um, a range of elements from uh, executable files, operating systems, uh, interface design, uh, design, source code, uh, hardware, uh, contextual items such as uh, interviews, uh, documentation of user experience, uh, social history content, uh, curated captures, uh, and so on. So here it is especially difficult to identify clear boundaries uh, between the core and the auxiliary items uh, within the acquisition, and it might ultimately be meaningless uh, and very, or very dependent on uh, specific curatorial and uh, pragmatic choices. So to conclude, just to um, summarize that the three case studies uh, illustrate how both digital acquisitions may present uh, infrastructural properties, 
demanding for careful processes of the contextualization from the network system and the software system where they are embedded or where they have been produced, leading to uh, reconfigurations of the relationship across the multiple items composing the object and to recontextualizations within the museum's own infrastructure. So the hope uh, is that by focusing on both digital objects, reliance on infrastructures uh, will help museum, museums developing new approaches to care for these objects uh, and encourage more experimentation across the sector. For instance, one of the next steps uh, would be to address the tension between sustainability and future proofing, as on one side, collecting multiple items can put a strain on an institution's limited resources, uh, therefore being uh, unsustainable. But on the other side, the availability of a range of contextual and process-related materials can ensure that curators and conservators will have more than one option in terms of uh, uh, preservation and display solutions and uh, will be able to reconstruct uh, or interpret uh, the object uh, once obsolete, uh, uh, thanks to the rich uh, documentation collected. So thanks for listening. Uh, here there is a, a link to the project page where you can find some resources such as our research report and recommendations and uh, a couple of data models that could be useful to museum professionals. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Paula Fernandez and I am an art conservator and pre-doctoral researcher at Universitat Politecnica de Valencia. For starting with my communication, I'd like to thank the event organizers for accepting our short paper. It is a pleasure to be here in ISEA again. Today, I'm also going to be speaking on behalf of my colleague Regina Rivas. She is a conservator at the Museo Nacional Reina Sofia, about a very personal topic for us as media art conservators, which is sustainability. Due to the limited time we have for today, we would like to speak briefly about two main ideas. First, the importance of new media art as a testimony of our actual society and the risks that endanger their future preservation, and also the need for preventive analysis of viability during the acquisition of this artwork. We will also see some interesting case studies in the end. Since new media art is a vast field, we have selected media art installations as our research object for today's presentation. Media art installations have been widely studied in some international preservation projects and are common in contemporary art museums. This type of artwork is made with two types of devices, commercial devices and self-made devices. And both of them suffer from the same issue, which is obsolescence. Obsolescence mainly affects the material aspects of the installation, but since artworks are meant to be exhibited, damage in functionality would mean endangering intangible value. As we can see in the graphic, obsolescence is a more significant threat in every new technology, since the rhythm at which it evolves is faster and faster. Even though newer devices have better specifications, their shelf life is shorter. Since many artists usually experiment with new technologies, conservators have to face a continuous state of decay. And traditional ways of preserving will not apply to media art installations. In these installations, technological devices are not a tool but a medium. Depending on the artist's intention, some may be essential for the artwork's meaning, whereas others may be replaceable. Before making any preservation decisions, conservators must reflect on this in order not to endanger authenticity. Strategies for media art preservation were stated in the 1998 in the variable media approach and are still up to date and valuable. According to this initiative, artworks must be analyzed through their behavior, not their original matter. Even though we try to respect authenticity, it would be naive to think that there are no changes made in the artworks when we perform preservation strategies. The art installations can suffer several changes to ensure interaction with the spectator. Are all of them bad? Change is a research topic in art preservation. Historically, we identified good change with patina, a change that heightens value, and lousy change as decay. But in media art installations, can we think about other types of changes? Sometimes, 
Since obsolescence will affect our devices, we will have to compromise on specific changes and produce different versions or iterations of the artwork. Since heritage is significantly related to context, it is also our job to ensure that new intangible values can be added to the artwork. For example, in some cases, the work of art can no longer be what it once was and requires a new ontological condition. This is what researcher Hannah Holling calls changeability. Perfect example is the artwork Send for Film, a performance by Nan Junpei that has evolved and is now a film installation, but its original material is also a relic, a static artifact. In this case, conservators have to work with the transformed object with different values. Additionally, we can also think about a valuable change for the conservator. In media art installations, a certain degree of applicable change within a range is beneficial for the work, since it allows further iterations and functional integrity. This is what we call variability. Although original aesthetic can be affected, preserving the artist's essential values and intention is possible. This is the case with the famous interactions of Nem Junpei's TV Garden. Or with a higher degree of change, the variation of transmission tower sentinel of Tara Birnbaum. With the help of the artists, who should be open to the change and transformation of their installations based on their behaviors, it is possible to apply change. It is essential to state that every media art installation should be evaluated individually. Once we have accepted that change can be a useful tool for conservators, some new questions come to mind. For example, where do we draw the limits? Or even further, when do we have the ideal degree of knowledge to make an informed decision? To acquire that knowledge and apply these strategies, documentation should be performed throughout the entire existence of the artwork, ideally starting in the production of the installation. And it must capture the initial interaction with the participation of spectators and different stakeholders. In the ideal scenario, artists should work with conservators, as some have publicly stated, like Rafael Lozano Remer. If the artist is no longer alive, versioning should be limited to this specific instruction. But the most common scenario is in the in-between, in the acquisition stage, when conservators must have a higher degree of participation. The artist interviews should be performed in this stage, but perhaps the most critical part is a proper feasibility analysis. This includes questions about the overall cost of maintenance, equipment, property rights management, and mutualization. Before a media installation enters the museum, we need to consider these costs and be realistic about maintaining its integrity and functionality. Because the artwork is meant to be exhibited and enjoyed, but this can get very expensive. For example, we have to think about the costs of storage for devices, but also for digital files, and sometimes we will need to outsource the service. Also, the cost of production and installation, there is often a technician involved, since conservators are not always properly trained. Fungible elements and interactive elements may need to be replaced often, I think in of light bulbs, for example. And of course, maintenance and conservation costs are high. We need to have the adequate equipment to analyze the conservation condition of the artwork. We will see now some examples that show the difficulties of exhibiting media art installations. All of them are from artworks present in the Museo Nacional Reina Sofía collection right now. For example, this is Los Incontados, un tríptico, um, an artwork from the artistic group Mapa Teatro. The installation has four spaces with video projectors, screens, multiple channels of audio and video, the fog machine, and an automated music band. Most of the elements are synchronized so issues are common. There was a lot of trial and error in exhibiting it, and it requires bi-weekly maintenance. This other installation by José Valdelomar has different issues, especially the high storage cost since the installation has more than a thousand elements, and it is not always possible to keep the self-made equipment functioning. But issues do not come only in more extensive installations, but also the simpler ones. For example, the famous TV decollage by Wolf Postel underwent preservation treatment recently. Obsolescence is the most significant issue with these pioneering installations since there are no longer technicians that specialize in CRT TVs, or even the exact number of them with equal measurements available in the market. 
and if finding CCRT TVs is difficult, imagine finding 40 for an installation like this. In this case, the issue is not aesthetic since they don't need to be the same. But the number of hours that the installation functions in the museum up to 12 hours a day non-stop. A technician is needed often to keep the exhibition running. In these last slides, we have gathered some final thoughts about what we have discussed. First of all, museums must shift the view from a so-called freeze-frame paradigm based on the illusion of eternal steadiness to an awareness of future possibilities and evolving identities. The limits of variability should be decided as soon as possible, taking in consideration immaterial values. These decisions should be taken in the present, especially in the acquisition process, in order to ensure the feasibility of the installation. Also, institutions should acquire always thinking about sustainability and feasibility. Artworks are meant to be exhibited, not storaged, and there is a need for responsible acquisition. But we would also like to finish our presentation with some questions that come to our mind uh, while writing the paper. For example, uh, should all artworks be exhibited 12 hours a day, 6 days a week in a museum? Maybe it is time that we reconsider how we exhibit artworks that are as fragile as media art installations. Also, can institutions really undertake the expense of complex media art installations so that they are not deactivated? And of course, do institutions that collect media art installations have enough professionals to ensure preservation? There is a clear need for trained conservators, but not enough educational opportunities. Please let us know your opinions on these matters, and we hope we can have a really nice debate within ICR conference. Thank you. Hello. My name is Ricardo Dalfarra. I'm going to talk about memory's death or the desire of immortality. The idea is to talk basically about media art and electroacoustic music in Latin America. The journey from the cultural memory and the ethical concerns to the practical strategies on preservation and the impact of dissemination knowledge generated by computer art has been navigating a sinuous road. Memory's death could benefit some as much as the desire for immortality could block the way to innovation open naturally to new generations. Computer art memory has been partially dead or perhaps deaf or blind or simply looking to the other side, maybe to avoid the perception that the so-called digital revolution has reached most of the known world and that history does not happen only in a few central countries. The desire of immortality and for being a cultural lighthouse as much as the guardian of the right values and the significant art should not take us all to mislead that intelligence and sensibility belongs to a few. Who tells history? Who knows about it? Or who has the opportunity to do it? So let me show some examples. For example, the Media Art History platform that um, has been showing mainly uh, digital art from some countries until recently. Uh, now the situation is a little bit different and this is of course a great project, it's a wonderful project, but the focus has been mainly on some countries and some regions and not to other. Only, as I said, in the last few years, it has been more open to receive what was happening in other countries. So we can find multiple versions about the computer art history, most of them with subtle differences, but it has been unusual until recently to find references pointed to countries out of a small group from Europe and North America. And you can find many other artists, like for example, Palatnik. So Abraham Palatnik in, in Brazil and how he was a pioneer of technology and art many, many years ago. Inequalities have always existed, and if we want to see a change, probably we will need to work hard ourselves to produce new results. There are many lost and hidden stories about the computer art that probably should be part of the official history and not just left aside. There have been people, ideas and concept, artwork, discoveries and inventions, and we expect someone will take care of keeping the memory of all that for us, but sometimes it simply doesn't happen. And when we look around after a while, it seems that the history has not been the one we thought it was, and we remember, 
but a different one that is being told by others. So, uh, also DOCAM, the Documentation and Conservation of the Media Arts Heritage Project, that was an international project, also another very, very important project preserving, uh, conserving media arts heritage. But again, I mean, we need to see um, how this was evolving and how these projects were including not only a new uh, European or eventually North American uh, new media art, but what was happening in other parts of the world. So between the obsession for archiving everything and the difficulty uh, and a strong responsibility of deciding what to preserve, the opportunity to archive computer art make us face a challenge involving from technical issues to political, social, cultural, and economical aspects. How many histories can be told about the same subject? To who their narrative is directed? The digital divide could be not linked today to who has access to the web, but to who dominates the inclusion of content or develop the strategies to keep our attention on certain places and not others. It looks like we are bombarded with cues guiding us to consider that the art conceived by some cultures are the only ones to be recognized as valid. So and we have the La Fondation Daniel Langlois pour l'art, la science et la technologie. So this uh, fantastic place also another project very important for preserving uh, media arts in the world. So the Daniel Langlois Foundation for Art, Science and Technology in Montreal has been a leading organization heavily focused on studying theoretical aspects related to preserving electronic and computer art and actually archiving it. So we have a lot of projects, same as in, in, in the DOCAM or the Media Art History Project. I mean, we have a lot of very, very interesting projects. And happily, in some cases, we have also art out of the European and North American regions. A number of major projects have been developed uh, or hosted there um, in the Langlois Foundation website since the late 90s, including the Stain and Woody Basulka Fonds, the Nine Evenings Theater and Engineering Fonds, the collection of documents published by the EAT, and the Latin American Electroacoustic Music Collection, among many others. So. Um, this is part of what you can see at the Daniel Langlois Foundation website. And some of these, um, of the project I was mentioning, you can see it here in these uh, images. So could you imagine a world without art? Could you imagine a world without music? So I'm going to talk a little bit about music and technology innovation in Latin America. Here are only some uh, of the many, many names that were pioneers in, in countries around Latin America. That's part of the electroacoustic music history and is part of the electronic art history, and in some cases, computer art history too. So for example, Mauricio Kagel, uh, that he was born in Argentina, he was already doing in the very early 50s, some uh, projects like you can see here, uh, Kagel eight studios or ocho studios, in between 90, 1950 and 1953, or Musica para la Torre, that was uh, music concrete and instrumental music, also in 1953, 54, 54, sorry. And he was doing this in Argentina. Then he moved to Germany, where he lived uh, for a long time there. Also in Brazil, like for example, Reginaldo Carvalho, or, or um, for example, Gilberto Mendes or George Antunes. So in Chile, Juana Menabar, 1950, when he composed Los Peces based on a Fibonacci series, or mixed pieces like Alfredo del Monaco in 1971, he was composing dualismos, or for example, Edgar Valcarcel from Peru, he was doing Retablo Uno, Flor de San Cayo for piano and electronic sounds. And he was using a very special notation too. So let me mention just briefly what Jacques Catali was saying about in his seminal book, Noise, the Political Economy of Music, with noise is born disorder and its opposite, the world. With music is born power and its opposite, subversion. Let me tell you a little bit about the history of Latin American electroacoustic and computer music. These are some CDs I was curating and creating 
together with radio programs, concert series, interviews, recorded collections, and CDs that I was working on on this in the already in the 70s and early 80s. So one was done with OO Disc. Another one was published in 1994 um, on the Leonardo Music Journal, and it was named Musica Electroacustica de Compositores Latinoamericanos, Electroacoustic Music by Latin American Composers. And in 1999, I was also curating another CD for Computer Music Journal. The music was there, but um, also was important to, to keep track of other aspects of um, electroacoustic music. So, uh, for example, in the UNESCO project Digi Arts, you can find um, historical aspects of electroacoustic music in Latin America from the pioneering to the present days. So, this was first an English version and then there was a Spanish version too. And I was um, making a full register as, as complete as possible about composers in different countries, as you can see in Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, and many more. All those numbers who has a plus sign is because I'm not only mentioning that report about composers and composition, but also about technical innovation in these countries. So this, just to give an introduction about the Latin American Electroacoustic Music Collection, where preservation, documentation, and dissemination were key aspects. Uh, taking care, of course, of different historical perspectives, why to preserve, and there were a lot of different problems, but let me mention a, a few names, at least, about pioneers, like Raul Pavón in Mexico, that he was creating like very interesting uh, projects in Mexico, including in the early 60s, the Omniphone, a voltage control synthesizer, that this is like a prototype of what he was doing. Or, for example, Raul Pavón was also working with visuals and music, creating with these Lisaju figures, like different projects that he was presenting in, the, in concert. So another issue that was very difficult to work with during the collection was the quality standards, what to preserve and how to preserve it. But let me talk a little bit about Cesar Bolaños in Peru. He was another pioneer who moved to Argentina for a few years, and he was like composing some of the first electronic works at the Didela Institute, and he was teaching other composers. He was also working in mixed pieces for instruments uh, and electronic sounds, and sometimes he was using computers uh, to calculate uh, aspects of the composition. Uh, also, let me talk a little bit about uh, Fernando von Reichenbach in Argentina. He was uh, creating amazing things also at the Ditela Institute, a very important figure in, in Buenos Aires. He was creating new devices and he was changing the way that composers were able to compose electroacoustic music there. So he was creating many interesting tools for composition. I don't have the time to stop here, but he was creating, for example, the analog um, converter used by uh, Pedro Karievsky to compose Analogias Paraboloides in 1970. This is Fernando von Reichenbach in Argentina. So let me let me go to, to, to the last part of this, mentioning, for example, Jorge Antunes, another pioneer that was doing electroacoustic music in Brazil in the early 60s. And there were a lot of files that you can listen not only read about this, but you can listen in the um, Daniel Langlois Foundation. Uh, you can find this collection I was creating. It's, it is the, it's the summary, we can say, of about 30 or 40 years, really, of work compiling music. So in this collection, you can find a lot of compositions, like uh, about 1,700 pieces, and you can listen to these pieces online. So. Uh, just to, to, to arrive to, to the last part of this presentation, uh, let me also mention the CEMAS, the Mexican Center for Music and Sound Art, and we did some projects together, including, like, it's a collection of three CDs, including some pieces of this composer I was mentioning, but also some compositions that were not including for different reasons in the collection. So this was done together uh, with the CEMAS in Mexico, but of course, the main uh, body it 
is in the Langlois Foundation and you can access online to that. Again, Jacques Catali, more than colors and forms, it is sounds and their arrangement that fashions societies. The Latin American Electroacoustic Music Collection, collection has recovered and made visible and listenable the creative work of many electronic artists, otherwise almost forgotten. It has defied the wish of immortality and the hegemony of the electronic art history narrative, breaking one of the memory's death roads and slowly shifting and widening the way the history of electroacoustic music is being known and understood. Archiving and disseminating electronic and computer art history findings is another relevant and significant way to comprehend the present and to build the future. So please access the Latin American Electroacoustic Music Collection. You can go there. You'll find over 200,000 words in the database with information about Latin American electroacoustic music and 1,723 full compositions, mostly for, for tape or fixed media, but also mixed uh, works. So I hope you will enjoy this. Um, this is part of the history of the media arts, electronic arts, computer arts, and electroacoustic music. Thank you so much for listening, and please listen to the work of so many wonderful electroacoustic music composers from Latin America. Thanks again.